Greetings, I'm Malik Israel. I started this podcast in order to share my unique views on this thing we call life and everything in it. And yes, I have the audacity to speak the truth. So brace yourself, because I'm known for being brutally honest. Welcome to the Audacity of Truth podcast with our host, Malik Israel. Welcome back to the Audacity of Truth podcast. I entitled this podcast, Genesis, the Making of Man, because I don't think that people understand that man was made. Most people think that man was created. It's a difference between being made and being created. You make things by assembling things together, you know, that are already here. When you create something, it comes directly from the consciousness. It comes directly from, basically, out of thin air. That's how God did most things. He created them. But then, other places in the Bible, you see misleading information or places where things are not clearly explained For example, based on what you read in Genesis, you think that animals, all the animals were created. Genesis never mentions anything about the animals being, or how they received the breath of life. All these animals, that breathe, they breathe. But you know out of Genesis that God, or God had his spirit, the spirit of life, breathe into the nostrils of man, and man became a living soul. It doesn't speak that heavily about the birds and the and the snakes and all of these other things that was created, right? So I'm going to search that out and see if I can find anything. Hold on. Based on my search and recollection, there's nothing mentioned in the Bible that talks about how the animals received the breath of life. Consequently, a lot of people don't believe that animals have the breath of life, but they do. Otherwise, the animals wouldn't have had to enter onto the ark during Noah's time. If they didn't have the breath of life, they wouldn't have had to enter onto the ark in order to save their lives. They could have just stayed where they were and Noah wouldn't have had to build such a big ark. But instead, the Bible describes the animals entering onto the ark by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. So, this is another misconception. The ones that entered onto the ark by twos are all of the unclean animals because Noah and his family had to resort to eating animals on the other side of the flood. Therefore, being servants of God, they couldn't eat unclean animals. They could only eat the animals that have been designated as being clean. So the ones that entered onto the ark by twos were all the unclean beasts, the ones that Noah and his family wouldn't eat. But instead... God had Noah gather all of the clean beasts in sevens. Clean beasts went in in sevens. Because think about it this way. If all the animals had entered onto the ark in twos, and Adam and his family, I mean, and Noah and his family would have eaten one of these beasts. It was a male, it was a male and female, by the way, that entered onto the ark in twos. A male and his female. So if Noah and his family had eaten one of these animals. Say for instance they would have ate the female, uh, whatever it was that they ate. Let's use swine. Let's say that Noah and his family would have eaten a female swine. That would have only left the male. So therefore, that species would have died off during or after the flood because it would have only been one left. It would have been no way for them to be fruitful and multiply. So therefore, it had to be clean beasts available for Noah and his family to eat after the flood. This is something that people, this is how you know that God set up the dietary law and for what reason God set up the dietary law and he had Noah follow specific instructions to perpetuate and continue the execution of that law. Okay, but anyway, all of these animals shared the same breath, which is called spirit. The one that most people call Jesus, because you know it couldn't have been Jesus back in the original biblical times, because there was no J in the alphabet. There was nobody walking the earth at that time called Jesus. I even doubt if they was called Jesus, like the Spanish called Jesus, right? Either way, no J's in the alphabet during that time. So John and James and all of them ones 
could not have existed during that time. These were either, these names was either a result of the Europeans gaining power over all these nations and renaming the people like they've done in the United States. You got all kind of melanin dominant people that have chosen to keep the slave master's name rather than going to spirit and finding out what their natural name is. Because like I said before, the nature of a thing is in the name, right? So it's unnatural for an Asiatic man to have a name like Charlie or James or Kevin, all of these type of things. I'm not going to even get into the last names because it's, it's preposterous. How can, how can a, a true Asiatic, a true melanin-dominant individual have a name like McMillan, you know, or be named Chauncey? Or some of this type of ridiculous stuff. But people don't seem to see how they dishonor their mothers and their fathers by continuing to accept these names. Even though their mothers and their fathers gave them a name that sounds like, the, like what they call their names. What I'm trying to say is, your mom and your dad gave you a name in upper and lowercase letters. But when you look at your driver's license and your state IDs and your insurance bills and whatever bills you get from the corporation, your name is written in all capital letters. I went into detail on this particular subject matter. You can go back and listen to some of my other podcasts and get more detail on this subject matter and understand who you are and who you are not as far as the government, your government, is concerned. Anyway, to continue with this, all these animals had the breath of life, which is spirit. I was about to say Jesus said the words that I speak. He said these words are spirit and life. He says the flesh profited nothing. So people are always trying to trace back what they think their genealogy is, which is basically impossible. They'll say, well, I'm part Irish and I'm part German, something of that sort. How can, you turn, how can you determine that? You would have to be able to trace your ancestry all the way back to its original form, which is virtually impossible to do because the Caucasian have been on the planet for almost 7,000 years. And the Asiatic, and the Bible confirms this, the Caucasian has been on the planet for almost 7,000 years. The, the Caucasian is the newest species of being on the planet. The so-called black man have been on the planet for, I would venture to say, millions of years. So how is it that a being that's been on the planet for millions of years allow a monster, which I'm going to finish making that point in this episode, allow a monster to come along and take over? Maybe that's why people are so afraid that the robots are going to take over because the robots were created by man. So since man was created by us and took over, they figure that the robots are going to take over too because the robots were made by man. Anyway, subject matter being is that how can the so-called black people allow this new species to come in and take over everything and rule over them and enslave them and so forth and so on? And I'll tell you why right now. You don't even have to contemplate it. It's because the so-called black man abandoned his God and started serving the Caucasian's God. That's why. The so-called black man has no God in this world, nobody to protect him. So like I said in the previous episode, he's susceptible to everything, to death by all means. I could tell you guys some things about my so-called supernatural encounters during the time span of my short existence on this planet right now, but you probably wouldn't know it. You probably wouldn't understand it because you can't relate to it. Because most of you, believe it or not, have no soul. And you wonder, how is that possible? You had a spirit of life. You had a breath of life in you, but you have no soul. I'm not talking about that soul that people call your body. Your body is called a soul. All of you got that. I'm talking about that genuine connection between you in the ethers, you in the universe. Prophet Noble Dr. Ali once said, all living things are connected to all other living things by a cord. So maybe he don't even consider the monster to be a living thing. Maybe these things that haven't come the natural course of creation, of manifestation. Maybe the prophet didn't consider these things to be alive. 
I don't know. I'm going to have to do some research on that. That's, a, that's an interesting topic. Either way, every living thing is connected to every other living thing by a cord. This is what Prophet Noble Drew Ali said. And I imagine this cord to be like the umbilical cord from the womb of the universe connected to you. That's how you get a soul. You have a direct connection to the universe. You don't need an intermediary to communicate with God. You do it directly like I do. And when I'm able to do that, I have all power. I have the same powers as God because I'm acting on behalf of God. You cannot be a representative of God if you are a swine flesh eater. And if you disobey the commandments of God, any of them, every simple, single commandment of God that I know of, I keep and I cherish. And I'm trying to help you, the listener, whoever's listening to this, I'm trying to help you get to that point where you can be blessed with the same powers that I have. The stuff that you see on these different programs, you know, like the series Heroes. And, you know, you look at these Marvel stories with Captain America, and these ones have all these different powers. These are the powers that the servants of God are supposed to have. But you don't because you don't serve God. You serve devils. I'm trying to get you to understand that so you can see the difference. I don't want to get into telling my whole story and all my different experiences. The reason why I know what I'm saying to you. Prophet Noble Drew Ali also said that man knows not by being told. You can't know anything because somebody told you that. All you have is information. The way that you know is through experience. When I speak to you about the Bible, most of these things I know because of my experiences. I've been around long enough to know. I've had enough experiences to know. i tried the spirit enough to know. Therefore, I can speak on behalf of God, which I always do, because that's what I'm here for. If you could ever realize that, you will realize that a prophet was amongst you, if you could ever realize that. But you're going to degrade me and, uh, and, and underestimate me and treat me like I'm you. Because you, you're haters. You don't want to recognize anything being greater than you. That's why you want to call yourself God. But you're a damn fool. You cannot be God. Nothing that's ever walked in this flesh can be God. How can I be as great as my creator? Monsters can be as great as their creators because they're monsters. You see what I mean? Like if a mo uh, one monster make another monster, then they're equal. Notice I use the word make rather than create. Because you can make things from what's already here. To create something, you have to come out of the ethers with it. It's got to come from the ethers. Like the computer was created. And all of these high technical devices were created by people who had the ability to connect to the ionosphere, uh, to the ethers, to the universe. And bring back this information on how to do this stuff. You do have the capacity to be a creator. You don't have the capacity to be God. You should work on that capacity and develop that capacity to be a creator by going inside and cherishing yourself and honoring yourself and quit dishonoring yourself by consuming poison, all of these different animals that you eat that poison the spirit and the body. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to recite some of God's dietary law for you. Hold on. All right, here we go. God's dietary law. I'm start reading at Leviticus Chapter 2, verse 1, where it says, And the Lord God spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are upon the earth. So now, this is God speaking to Moses and Aaron. And he said, Speak unto the children of Israel. So it was only one people that God's preferences and God's laws was given to. These are the same people that you today are supposed to be getting the word of God from. No wonder you're not getting the word of God because you go to the Gentile to learn the word of their God, not the God of the Bible. You want to learn about the God who is a devil. And I'm going to show you who this is. I'm going to show you exactly who this devil is. And I'm going to show you what his name is. And I'm going to show you that you worship and call on the name of this God that is not the God of the Bible. Anyway, verse 2 again. Speaking to the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts 
that are on the earth. Whatsoever parted the hoof and is cloven footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts that shall ye eat. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud or of them that divide the hoof as the camel. Because he cheweth the cud, nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud or of them that divide the hoof as the camel. Because he cheweth the cud but divided not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. Because he cheweth the cud, but divided not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divided not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divided not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divided the hoof and is cloven footed, yet he cheweth not the cud. So God is breaking down all these different animals that you can't eat. The first animal that he described is the cow. The cow powdered the hoof and is cloven footed and he cheweth the cud. So you can eat him, right? But all of the rest of these ones you can't eat, which you recognize the hare is a rabbit, which I know a lot of country people eat rabbit. I knew this country family that you, we used to go hunting when I was a child. And we would catch some rabbit. They would come back and cook it. And it tastes just like wild chicken. That's what that rabbit tastes like. But country people like to eat rabbit. And they some of them eat possums and all that. Possum ain't nothing but a big rat. See, they eat all of that stuff. You ain't supposed to be eating that stuff. Let me show you the rest of the stuff that God say. Even what you call so-called seafood. It might come out of the sea, but it ain't food. At least not for the children of God. All right. Let me go back to uh, verse 7 where it says, And the swine, though he divided the hoof, you know the swine is a pig, right? Or the hog, or whatever you want to call it. That's what a swine is. For those of you who want to play like you don't know what it is. And be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud. He is unclean unto you. Of their flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcass shall ye not touch. They are unclean to you. So the swine, he gave specific instructions for you not to even touch their carcass. So when you, your mama messed up when she pulled them pork chops out of the refrigerator, when she touched them, let alone cooked them and ate them, you out of order when you just bring them from the, from the grocery store. Because you had to touch them somewhere between... The grocery store in your refrigerator or your freezer. Verse 9. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas, and in the rivers, them shall ye eat. So all of your seafood, according to God, according to God's will, according to what God sanctioned for you to eat, needs to have fins and scales. If it doesn't have fins and scales, you can't eat it. Catfish don't have scales. Shrimp don't have scales. Lobster don't have scales. All of this stuff that you like to eat that you even consider, you pay a whole lot of money for this crap that you call yourself eating, but you're actually poisoning yourself. Long before I found God's dietary law, by nature, I got away from eating all of this stuff that I was trained or taught to eat when I was a child. Before I found out about God's dietary law, I quit eating shrimp. I quit eating lobster. Never ate catfish. Catfish is one of the most disgusting animals on the planet to me. Yeah, I ate pork chops and all, and all that type of stuff, bacon and all that type of stuff. Yeah, when I was young, I didn't know no better. But when you know better, you're supposed to do better. And you ones, you don't know better yet because, in you, because you have not suffered the consequences of eating all of this stuff that God told you don't eat. Just like this poison that's going around, poisoning and killing people. That's because them ones was eating some stuff that God said don't eat, right? But anyway, back to verse 12. Again, whatsoever has no fins, no scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. If it don't have fins and scales, it's supposed to be an abomination to you. Just like that catfish is to me. It's an abomination. You might be thinking, well, tuna, tuna don't have scales. Yes, it does. Do a search for it. I bet some devils one time that tuna had scales, and they bet me $100. And when we did the research on it and found out that tuna had scales, because I only bet when I know what I'm talking about, when I'm going to win. So I bet them $100, they lost, and they reneged on the bet. So now, they, uh, their, word has no, their word has no value. They've proven that. So once you prove that your word has no value, it's hard to make a covenant with God, because he's not going to believe that you mean what it is that you're saying. It's like most people do. Say, oh, God, help me with this. Help me get out of this. Let me get out of this jam, God, and I won't do what I did no more. And as soon as they get out of that jam, whatever it was, whether it's a life and death situation or whatever the case may be, when, as soon as God helped them get through the thing and a few weeks go by, 
they right back to doing what God, what they told God they wasn't going to do. You know, people see, uh, seem to take God's grace and kindness for weakness. Nothing about the God of the Bible is weak. God can be kind. But God can God controls all angels, including Satan. And he'll let Satan go on you. Then you finish. The, the very one you've been serving all this time, God will have him turn on you. That's Satan. Let me show you who Satan is in a little while. I'm going to show you who you've been worshiping. But anyway, let's finish this. Verse 15. No. We're going back to uh, 13 again. And these are they which shall have an abomination among the five. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle and the ostrich and the osprey and the vulture and the kite after his kind and the raven after his kind and the owl and the night hawk and the, and the cuckoo and the hawk after his kind and the little owl and the cormorant and the great owl and the swan and the pelican and the gear eagle and the stork and the heron after his kind after her kind and the lapwing and the bat all fowls that creep going Upon all four shall be an abomination unto you. See, all of these things that God is speaking on, it's not for the children of God to eat. It's for monsters to eat. It's for animals to eat. I don't know if I'm clear, if I made myself clear about what that monster is, but I'm going to touch on that again so everybody can be clear about who that monster is because that monster don't have no soul. So therefore, God cannot communicate with that monster. So he going to do, that monster is going to do whatever he want to do. Because there is no communication between God and that monster. That's why. But the children, the ones that call themselves the children, a child of God and that type of thing. This is for you. Even though it was given through Israel. Remember, Aaron and Moses spoke to the children of Israel. And told them about the things that they're supposed to eat and the things that they're not supposed to eat. If you're not a child of Israel, you ain't going to pay this stuff no attention. You're going to keep on being a monster. You're going to keep on being defiled. There is no God in the world for you, unfortunately. But you chose that path for yourself. You chose to come back to this existence as a monster from your previous existence. I know the Christians, they don't even talk about your previous incarnation. They don't talk about karma and stuff like that. No Christian that I know, even my teacher, the one that taught me to read the Bible, he called himself a Hebrew Israelite Christian. That's got to be an oxymoron. There's the only the only people that I know of on the planet that call themselves a Christian and an Israelite at the same time is these people. They rejected by the Christians and they rejected by the Israelites too. Anyway, we keep it moving. Verse 29, it says, These are all, these also shall be unclean unto you among the creeping things that creep upon the earth, the weasel, and the mouse, and the tortoise, after his kind, and the ferret, and the chameleon, and the lizard, and the snail, and the mole. You know, I've seen some monsters eat all of this stuff. One time, I was cracking jokes when, in my ignorance. I was cracking jokes, saying, while I was eating some shark. I said, I'm a man-eating shark. You get it? If you don't think about it for a minute, you might get it. Anyway, verse 32, and upon whatsoever... Any of them, when they are dead, doth fall, it shall be unclean. Whether it be any vessel of wood, or raiment, or skin, or sack, whatsoever vessel it be, wherein any work is done, it must be put into water, and it shall be unclean until the evening, so it shall be cleansed. Then it goes on about a lot of other things, which I advise you to pick up a Bible a King James Version of the Bible. This is the real Bible. All of that stuff, all that other stuff, that new uh, new Christian version of NLV or whatever they call all of them other Bibles, they're fake Bibles. They're only going to confuse you and lead you further down the wrong path. Anyway, pick up the Bible, read it, and learn something. So the main things about God's dietary law we covered because those are the things that you ordinarily find in the grocery store. So, which... Leads me to, to wonder, what are groceries, really? Let me take a look at that real quick. Then we'll continue. Now, I'm in the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary, where it defines the full meaning of grocery. It says, a store that sells perishable and non-perishable food supplies and certain non-edible household items. So I say that all of these things that God said that you should not eat, these should be categorized in the grocery store as non-edible household items rather than food. 
that's my point on that. All right, back to the subject matter. All right, I want to go back and finish covering something that I went over in the first part of this subject matter, which was part one of Genesis, the making of man. And I was talking about the woman being brought forth from the man and brought unto him to be a helpmeet. Okay, what I didn't specifically cover is that I covered the fact that man does not give birth, period. Never have, never will. It has to be something with a womb to bring forth life, right? So now, people want to say, mistakenly, erroneously, that Adam gave... I even heard my own teacher say this ridiculous shit, that man gave birth to a woman. That's bass accurate. Man has never given birth to anything except an idea or something like that. Anyway... When the rib was taken from Adam, oh, let me hold it right there. I want to show you who Adam is so you can understand who man is. I'm going to go to a concordance. For those of you who don't know what a concordance is, it's like a Bible dictionary. It tells you what the words of the Bible mean, each and every word. When you go to the front part of a concordance, the concordance that I like to use is Strong's Concordance. When you go to the front, of this concordance you see a glossary and it has numbers for each word that's in the bible and you can go to those numbers inside the concordance and find out what those words what the associated words mean so i'm selecting the word adam we're going to deal with the definition of adam so you can see exactly who adam is hold on okay i went to ai and in ai to get a definition of adam from the Strong's ex Exhaustive Concordance, it's kind of like pulling teeth. If I didn't have a knowledge of what was contained in the actual book, I would not have gotten the response that I got. But this is what I did. I went to AI and I asked, initially asked the question, give me the definition of Adam in the Strong's Concordance. And it gave me an de incomplete definition. It was somewhat acceptable. First thing it says was, definition of Adam, Strong's number H120. That's the number. Primary meaning. It says man, comma, mankind. Etymology from the Hebrew, root, meaning to be read or ready. Usage in the Bible. A human being, mankind in general. Adam, the first man, right? This didn't have all of the information that I already knew was there. I modified the question and I asked for AI to give me all text under number H120 and H121. It gave me 120 again the same way. And under 121, it said, this appears to be used specifically as the proper name, Adam. The search results don't provide much detail on H121 specifically. So then I asked the question, isn't there some text there referring to man being quote unquote low, comma, quote unquote mean, comma, quote unquote of low degree, comma, shows blood in face, comma, quote unquote hypocrite. AI responded, you're correct. The Strong's definition for H120 or 120 does include some of those terms. Here's the relevant part from the search results. Strong's definition from H119, ready, i.e., a human being, right? In parentheses it says, an individual or species, comma, mankind, comma, ETC. Then it has X another, comma, plus hypocrite, plus common sort, comma, X low, comma, man, mean of low degree, comma, person. So it's saying here that Adam is ready, a human being. Remember we looked at the definition of human being in the Ballantyne's Law Dictionary, where it says a human being is a monster. It says sea monster. So the definition of monster is what a human being is. Then it goes on to say, another, it says Adam is a hypocrite. And it says Adam is a common sort. It says Adam is a low man. Adam is a mean man. 
of low degree, right? So all of these things. Then it goes on to say, the term shows blood and face isn't directly mentioned in H120 definition, but it's related to the root word Adam, which means to show blood in the face. So Adam shows blood in the face. So I ask you, which one, which group of people does this definition apply to? Do it apply to black people? Do black people show blood in their face? Or is it Caucasians that show blood in their face? Let me express this. I'm not trying to piss anybody off. I'm not trying to trigger anybody. I'm not trying to make anybody angry or offend anybody. I'm just expressing the truth as far as this definition is concerned. The truth as far as who Adam is. The, the truth as far as who man is. Who mankind is. Man and mankind show blood in their face. They're mean. They're hypocrites of low degree. Right? This is the definition. I didn't write this. This is an AI and is in the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Look it up for yourself. But I'm showing you who man is. Plus it also said that man is a human being. So all of you ones running around calling yourself human, you wasn't created by God. You wasn't made by us. Well, yeah, you were. And I'm going to show you, you were made by us because us made man. And this is saying that man and the human being is the same thing. Man and the human being is the same thing according to the concordance. Human being is not mentioned in Genesis, meaning that us was not expressed as being the maker of man, which was formed from the dust, remember? Formed from the dirt. So man was made from something that was already here. It wasn't created. Us, which is a being or a group of beings, you know, similar to Frank and Stein, you know, they use these so-called Jewish names when they refer to Israel because these so-called Jews stole Israel's identity and began calling them things that they identify as being Jewish names. You know, Jewish means something like a Jew. But the real Jews are one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of those tribes is called Judah. That's who these so-called Jews are trying to perpetrate being. They've taken on the identity, the false identity of being from the tribe of Judah. Even though they try to identify, they try to disguise it by saying they are Jewish. Means something like a Jew. Okay, you can say you something like a Jew if you keep his traditions and his practices and all of those type of things. Then you can say you something like a Jew. Same way that Moors call themselves Moorish. Meaning that there's something like Moors. Follow what I'm saying? Either way, point is made. Man shows blood in his face. So that means without objection, that the so-called black man is not man at all. So, I'm going to see if I can help you figure out who this man, who, the, who black people really are, if you haven't figured it out already. Because the Bible says this. Hold on, let me read it for you. This is the King James Version of the Bible, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, where it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Again, this is the King James Version of the Bible. God expressing a reminder to his people who are called by his name. Okay, so now we need to figure out who's doing this talking. I already know, but y'all guys, y'all need to figure out who it is. Who are the people that's called by God's name? And what is that name? Are the people called Jesus or are the people called Israel? I can tell you right now, the people are called Israel. Israel are God's people. You know how they say God's chosen people? I'm going to read one verse from 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 6, where it says, But I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. He said, but I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there and have chosen David to be over my people Israel. 
He's chosen Jerusalem that his name might be there, meaning that his people, Israel, might be there. But today, that is not the case. Israel is not occupying Jerusalem. That's why Jerusalem is catching hell right now to expel the fake Jews out of Jerusalem. You're catching hell right now. They're being bombarded daily by Hezbollah and the rest of the Arab nations over there that know they are not Israel. See, Israel is the brothers of the Muslim people. Ishmael was the son of Abraham. Ishmael is the father of the Muslims, that great nation that's spoken of in the Bible. Ishmael and Israel are family. A lot of Israelites that don't know that they're Israelites have taken on the religion Muslim. For example, the nation of Islam and ones like that. Even the Moors have taken on Islam, not realizing that they are Israel, even though Minister Louis Farrakhan has taught the Muslims in the nation of Islam that they are the children of Israel. But still, they go under their brother's religion, which is Islam. Israel actually has no religion. They have a complete way of life. You know, worshiping God is a way of life. Worshiping the God of Israel. Why do you think the Bible constantly say the God of Israel? Because that's Israel's God. When they pray, our Father, which art in heaven, they're talking to the God of Israel. So they're saying that the God of Israel is the children of Israel's father. Everybody needs to understand this because the word of God was given to his children. You know how a father sits down and they tell their family about the nature and the heritage of the, of the lineage, of the, of the bloodline? That's what happened. It was given to Moses. Moses' job was to give it to the children of Israel. So if you want to get the word of God and get it right, you have to get it from Israel, and you're getting it right now. All of these false prophets coming to you in the name of Jesus, they are false prophets. They are not Israel. They're teaching you about a false God. I'm telling you about the true and living God. I'm telling you about his ways and his desires and what he intends to have happen here. They want to try to send you to heaven. The false prophets try to send you to heaven. The God of Israel said, his kingdom is coming down out of heaven. The only one in the whole Bible trying to get to heaven is the devils. So if you're trying to get to heaven, if you believe you're going to heaven, you've been taught by a devil. The God of Israel just read for you where he wants his name to be in Jerusalem. Where his people, he wants to be amongst his people. How you show that God is amongst the people? By obeying the commandments of God. So when you see New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven... In the Bible. Let me read that for you. Because you people are confused. I'm going to read one verse for you. Which sums up the whole matter. Revelation 21 verse 2. And I John. Saw the holy city. New Jerusalem. Coming down from God. Out of heaven. Prepared. As a bride adorned. For her husband. So this new Jerusalem. Coming down out of heaven. Is all decked out. Adorned as a bride is adorned for her husband. The bride, it's a lot, it's a lot to learn. And I'm, I'm going to try to teach it to you as, as best I can. In as short of amount of time as I can. Because this is of the utmost importance. And your very existence, your very salvation is dependent upon this information. Your very salvation is dependent upon receiving this information. All right, let's keep it moving. So now, I've shown you heaven. I've shown you man. I've shown you mankind. I've shown you who Adam is. I've shown you the dietary law of God. I've, show, I've shown you the beast that you're supposed to... Actually, man is supposed to get its meat from fruits and vegetables, just like the gorilla and the rest of the most powerful beasts on the planet. Man is supposed to get his fruits and vegetables from that, not eating other animals. This is why man dies prematurely, because after the flood, uh, Noah and family were forced to eat the clean beasts that they brought over on the ark. 
But after a while, the vegetation grew back. But by that time, Noah and family had developed a taste for meat. So they wanted to keep eating animal meat. They just mixed in a few fruits and vegetables like people do today. The main course is the meat. The side dishes is the vegetables. Either way, I've shown you all these things. Now, it's time for me to show you who Jesus is. Watch this. I'm going to start this in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, where it says, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, and have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then verse 11, Revelation 19 and 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dripped in blood. And his name is the Word of God. Now I'm going to John. Chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now I'm going to read one verse from John 1 and 14, where it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now I'm going to read one verse from John 3 and 16. John chapter 3 verse 16 where it says, in red writing I might add, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So purportedly when you find text that's written in red, it's supposed to be the actual speakings of the man Jesus. Because Jesus was a man. Now remember, they called him the son of man, right? They also called him the son of God. Which this verse tends to imply that. Because it said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's purportedly for the sacrifice. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, but this is supposed to be the words of Jesus because it's written in red. So if it is the words of Jesus, then he's speaking in the third person because he said that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't say he gave me as his only begotten son. It says that God gave his only begotten son, Jesus speaking now, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. He didn't say whosoever believeth in me should not perish. So somebody got something screwed up right here. Jesus is saying basically that somebody else is the son of God that was given because God so loved the world, right? Y'all see that? Well, keep reading that until you get that. Now we're going to go a little further. Going to Revelation 22 and 16 where it says, I, Jesus, again written in red, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So Jesus here, speaking in first person, he said, I have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. He says, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. He's talking about King, King David here. But I ask you, what is the bright and morning star? That's the sun. That's the S-U-N. That star that's bright in the morning and shines light on the whole planet periodically, that is the bright and morning star. So let's find out who, Je who this Jesus is then because somebody else was given because God so loved the world. Then this Jesus, he said, I Jesus, right? Okay, y'all got that part. Now he's saying he's the bright and morning star. Is that the only begotten son of God? Is that the only begotten son of God? I ask that again because that's what it's got to be because God has many sons. Let me show you that. I'm going to Genesis chapter 6 verse 2 
and read one verse where it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So the sons of God saw the daughters of men. I just showed you who man was, right? Now these sons of God saw these daughters of men and said them daughters was fine, right? So they took them wives of them, which they chose. I once heard Larry Bird, which is a basketball player, once say that when he saw Michael Jordan in a basketball uniform, he saw God playing basketball. So are you shaping this form, this figure in your head as to who the sons of God is? Are the sons of God us, the ones that made man? Because Adam is this one that has blood in his face. So all beings that came from Adam are man. So if you're a man, if you consider yourself to be man, then you do the things that man does. Man is also a human. According to Ballantyne's Law Dictionary, man is a monster. Man and monsters eat anything like animals because Ballantyne's Law Dictionary say that they resemble the lower animal, the human, the monster, right? That's more clearly depicted in the first episode of this topic, subject matter. So if you haven't heard that, maybe you need to go back and listen to that. The point here is, is that I'm trying to show you who Jesus is, the man Jesus. And I'm going to show you the word of God, which is also named Jesus. So you got two Jesuses here. You got the spirit Jesus, which is the word of God. And you got the son of man Jesus, which is this man that walked the planet and so forth and so on. So you have to make a, distinct, uh, a distinction between the two. There's a lot of other Jesus down here by uh, different pronunciations of the same name. If you if you pronounce it in Spanish, it says Jesus. But that's funny because the Greeks worshipped Zeus. Hispanics called Jesus' name Jesus, but nevertheless, it was the Greeks and the, the Greeks who are the fathers of the Spaniards, of the Spanish, they call, they, they name their sons Jesus. So another way of saying Jesus is to say Jesus. So you're actually saying Zeus. When you say Jesus, you're saying Zeus. Actually, I can show you that in the concordance that Zeus is Jesus. Zeus is a false god, just like Jesus is a false god. But I'm going to go a little further. I'm going to show you a little bit more where this is the cherry on top of the, uh, uh, the ice cream sundae, right? The S-U-N day, or is it the S-O-N day? But I showed you where the son, the begotten son of God, is most likely the sun that, that sheds light on the whole planet, that perpetuates life with that light, that raises the dead to life. In other words, all of the seeds that's planted in the earth, once they are watered and the light of the sun is shined upon them, then they are raised to life. Anyway, let's go a little further. You know, the ones that think they know a little something about the Bible would probably use this as a defense. That is found in John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth into darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, right? The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Okay, so John came to bear witness of this light that's spoken of right here in John chapter 1. But remember, this light was made, right? It says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So in him was life, and life was the light of men. Now the sun, the S-U-N, shines a light. And without this light, there is no life 
in men. So again, here, we're talking about the S-U-N, not the S-O-N. They've intentionally confounded the script to try to give justification for the falsehood represented by the man called Zeus. Oh, I meant to say Jesus. I meant to the pronunciation is Jesus, okay? Either way, you should be able to clearly see unless you've been sent a strong delusion that you might believe a lie, which many of you have because you've loved and dealt with and believed lies for so long till you can hardly tell what truth is. Truth sounds like a lie to you. You've been dealing with lies so long. Either way, here in John, it says the word, you say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this Word, the Word of God was with God, because he spoke everything into existence. God spoke a Word that brought everything into existence. So that Word was with God. The Spirit name for the Word of God is Jesus, because I showed you in Revelations where Jesus' name was called. The word of God, because all of the, the one with the vesta dripped in blood and all that, that's supposed to represent Jesus riding on the white horse, right? There you go with the white again, you know, because the so-called white man has got blood in his face. So are we talking about this monster that was made creating a God for himself and calling his name Jesus? Jesus is the white man's God. Jesus is not Israel's God. The God of the Bible is the God of Israel. I hope you can see that difference. That's the, that is the distinct difference. That's the difference between a God and a devil. Let me show you something else. Hold on. Now I want to show you a conversation between the man, Jesus, and the de uh, Satan. I'm not going to say the devil. He's the father of devils, I should say. This is Satan speaking. Going to Luke chapter 4, verse 3, where it says, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Verse 4, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So here, Jesus did not respond to Satan's challenge. Satan said, uh, well, if you be the son of God, I could command these stones to be made of bread. Jesus gave a send-off response, talking about man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. I agree with that. Man should not even try to live by bread alone. But at the same time, it's very rare to find any man that believes in the word of God enough to obey the commandments of God because they give you the unoriginal testament to read. Forget all of the forget all of the original testament that you might call the Old Testament. Forget the Old Testament. Just start reading in the middle of the book. And you're supposed to get a full understanding from that. Because Jesus is not mentioned by the Hebrews. Because Jesus did not exist during Hebrew time. These Gentiles, which ones want to call uh, Israelites, wrote the so-called New Testament. They had no writings in the Old Testament, because you hear all of them ones named John and, and Jesus and, 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 and all of this type of stuff. All of these Gentile names were the ones that, re, that wrote in the so-called New Testament. Jesus, the word Jesus is not mentioned anywhere in the original Testament or what they call the Old Testament. That's why they don't want you dealing with that. These Christians don't want you dealing with the Old Testament. The original testament. How can you get the understanding of a book when you only read the last half of it? You can't. And that's the whole intent. The whole intent behind Satan or the devil is to deceive the whole world. First, he deceived you into believing that you can read half a book and get the understanding of the whole book. That's absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, we're going to go a little further. Again, Luke 4 and 4 says, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written. So Jesus started talking about what was written. He didn't step up to the challenge as being the son of God to make those stones turn into bread. Okay. Verse 5. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, 
all this power will I give thee, and all the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered him, said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Okay, again, Luke chapter 4 verse 8 says, And Jesus answered him, and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. So now, when you look at the condition of the world today, keep in mind what was said, what the devil said unto him, which the him is Jesus, the man. He said, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, the glory of all the power of all of the people, the glory of all them that was in these lands that Satan was showing him. He said, I will give you the glory of them. Right? Okay. Now, let's see what glory means. Hold on. I'm going to an online dictionary where it says glory. Number one definition. High renown or honor won by notable achievements. If you died for everybody's sin, then you get, that's a notable achievement, is it not? Number two definition. Magnificence or great beauty. Jesus is supposed to have been this magnificent being, this most beautiful being, uh, deserving of honor and glory, right? Now I want to go to the verb, the verb definition of glory. Take great pride or pleasure in. Terms that mean similar things as glory, take great pleasure in. People take great pleasure in Jesus. Exalt in. They rejoice in. They delight in. They revel in. They relish all of these things. Do they do as honor and glory to Jesus? Here's a different definition. Great admiration. Glory means honor. And to praise. At the end of all of these prayers, they say, In Jesus' name, amen. Or I pray in Jesus' name. Or praise Jesus, praise God. When they say praise God, they're talking about Jesus. I'm talking about Christians. When Christians say praise God, they're talking about Jesus. To them, Jesus is God. But I've showed you all over the book, every definition that I could find, that Christians worship devils. I'm going to show you something else in the Bible in a minute, but let me finish this definition. It says, glory means great admiration, honor. They honor Jesus by saying, in Jesus' name we pray. They're praying in the name of Jesus. They're praying in the name of a devil. They're praying in the name of Zeus, Jesus. Give glory to something is saying something which deserves admiration or honor. Then it says, he basked in the glory of his victory. You know, the Christians always say, I got the victory in Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm trying to make this point. Let me go back and make this point where it says in Luke, where Satan told the man Jesus in Luke verse 4, chapter 6, and the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them the glory of who? The glory of the people is the power. Everybody following you, the, like they say, there's power in numbers and so forth and so on. Just about everybody you know does this. And they show that they are Jesus worshiper. Jesus is supposed to be Christ. Matter of fact, it even gotten to the point where they say Jesus Christ, like Christ is his last name. Because they know that he didn't have a Hebrew name, so they want to say Christ is his last name. The books say Jesus the man called Jesus was Jesus of Nazareth. If he had been of Nazareth of the biblical names, he wouldn't have had a name starting with a J. It was no Johns, and it was no James, and it was none of these J's. Nobody walking around with these names in biblical day, in the days of the Bible, okay? Period. But anyway, all this power and all this glory, Satan did give to Jesus because he's glorified by all the people. So that means that what? Jesus followed Satan. Jesus worshiped Satan because he got all of that power because that remember that power was given to Satan and Satan gave it to whomever he wanted to. So he gave that power to Jesus and Jesus is glorified by the people. Bottom line, when you worship Jesus, you're worshiping Satan because Jesus is Zeus, a false god. 
So one more thing I want to show you real quick. Watch this. Satan is so efficient at deceiving people till the very ones that worship him, he deceived them to the point where they don't even know that they're worshiping him. Watch this. I'm going to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, where it says, But I say that the things which Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. So here is a Gentile telling on itself. These are Gentiles in 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. They're all Gentiles that was brought into the church, right? Made a part of the church on Pentecost. So these Gentiles telling on themselves. They said, well, the things in which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to the devils and not to God. This is talking about that big old turkey that you have on your table on Thanksgiving or on Christmas. That's the sacrifice. That sacrifice is being made to devils, the chief devil which is Jesus, because they're praying in Jesus' name. They say, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The amen means Amen Ra, which is the sun god. So you're sacrificing to devils and not to God. And that's what you've been doing your whole life because that's what you've been taught. Mom and grandmama taught you to serve devils. How else can you be a homosexual and a drug abuser and a womanizer and a, a thief and a robber you know, how can you be all these things and nevertheless be sitting up in church every Sunday talking about you worshiping Jesus, praise Jesus. Jesus saved me from my sin. That's ridiculous. Can nothing save you from your sin? Only thing you can do is quit sinning. That's all you can do. How is the devil going to save you from your sin? The devil is the one that caused you to sin. The devil was the one that was standing up in the garden talking to Adam or rather talking to Eve, and Eve ate the fruit of lies, not an apple. Eve ate the fruit of lies and took that back to Adam, and Adam did eat. So by a devil, sin entered into the world because it beguiled Eve into believing those lies. The first lie was, well, you won't surely die. God told Adam that in the day that you eat of the fruit thereof, that day you shall surely die. And that's what happens. And that's what continues to happen. Every time you go to the funeral home and you see one of your loved ones in that casket, it means that they died because of sin. Because without sin in the world, people would not die. I'm going to wrap it up right here. I want to thank you for your time. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word and to my ministry. In the name of the God of Israel, I pray. We want to encourage you to make suggestions on the topics you the listening audience, want discussed on our podcast. Call 623-986-4688 to voice your suggestions, comments, or concerns.